Mary was really scared when the angel came to her. There was one main angel called Gabriel. He was just a boy angel. He had wings and he was all dressed in white. The angel said, you're going to have a special baby and it will be a son. Mary was like, that did not just happen. And then she thought, cool, I'm having a baby. And then she was like, I can't, I'm not married and stuff. Joseph, he was a builder. Mary told Joseph she was gonna have a baby called Jesus, and it was God's son. Joseph dropped his tools and was like, what? That's crazy. He thought maybe Mary had married someone else. Then Joseph saw an angel in a dream, and he was like, oh, so that's why you're pregnant. And they went to Bethlehem on a donkey. Joseph walked because he wouldn't dare to ask Mary to walk with the baby in her tummy. She probably wished she had a car to ride in. And she said she wanted to go home and she was thirsty and hot and tired. Then she probably wanted to know how much longer because her belly was exhausted. Joseph went to all the hotels, and there was no space. Nope, there's no space. Everyone said no in an angry voice because it was the middle of the night. I said no. The last innkeeper, he said, well, there's a barn type thing around that. They had to go into a smelly barn and have the baby. Hurry, Betty Sue, run! It had sheep. It was like all hay and animal poop and sheep and things. Mary put baby Jesus in one of those troughs. They called the baby Jesus and they loved him. Mary thought, I hope I'm a good mommy and he's so cute. As Joseph gazed on the Son of God, he was like, Way to go, Mary! We did it! And Mary was like, We? They were so happy. A Messiah had come to save the world. We? I want us to take a look at that very simple Christmas story, and I have a very simple theme I want you to remember. Christmas is about God's amazing plan, and it is not our plan, and it is not always easy, but it is always the best. If you think about this simple, familiar story of Mary and Joseph, and you realize that they had a plan, an idea for their life. Just as each one of us have dreams and ideas and kids, you know, everybody that's an adult says to you, what do you want to be when you grow up? And it changes generally about monthly. And we have these ideas and these dreams, and when God interrupts your life, it won't be to fulfill all of your dreams. It will be to call you into his plan, into his dreams. So I want us to walk through that individual, and if you are here with your coloring uh, page and your crayons, you can color Mary. We're going to talk about her for a couple of minutes. And you realize this young, young girl could have been as young as 14, 15, 16. And she was in this little town of Nazareth. And every, the biggest thing you ever did was you went down to Jerusalem once in a while. And otherwise you lived in this little town. And she was engaged to this great guy named Joseph. And he was a builder. And, and he had a solid job, and their life was kind of figured out. They were not, we would call it engaged, but it was a different process. It was a, they called a spouse, where they were given a vow to marry each other. They were called husband and wife, but they didn't yet live together. And so she looked like she had this, this whole plan for her life, this whole dream. She was going to grow up in this little town. She was going to 
have fat little baby children, and she was going to be with Joseph and have a solid job, and her life was going to be safe and, and comfortable. And all of a sudden, God interrupts that story. And it starts in Luke chapter 1 like this. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent an angel Gabriel to Nazareth, to a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary, and the angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. And Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God, and you will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus, and he will be great, and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever, and his kingdom will never end. If you can get into the place where Mary was as a young woman expecting her life to be a certain way, and all of a sudden this angel comes and these words would have been like crashing across her. You're going to have a child. The details hadn't been yet revealed. But he's going to be called the Son of the Most High. He's going to be on the throne of his father David. He's going to be following this kingly line. You're not going to be in a quiet little Nazareth town. You're, you're going to have a king. And then he said, and his kingdom will never end. And if you can imagine trying to take all this information in as a young woman whose dreams are being completely interrupted, and she has to, to pause for a minute and say, how can that be? And I think she was asking that on so many levels. How can this plan be God's plan when it is so opposite to my plan? And so she says, how will this be since I am a virgin? And the angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come on you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you so that the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. And she who was said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month. So he explains to her what is absolutely impossible. She's going to have a child as a virgin. She is going to be this move from this quiet, remote village to the center of God's plan. And I want you to see the theme that we just talked about. God had a plan for Mary. It was an incredible, good, beautiful plan, but it was not Mary's plan. And I think it's important for us to say it was not always easy. What does that mean? Well, as the story unfolds, not only does she have a child or she's ready to have a child, but she has to go to Bethlehem because of the census. And then King Herod finds out that there's another king on the rise and he sets out to kill them. And so she goes from this quiet, sheltered village to Bethlehem. Finally, they run to Egypt because the king of the land is trying to kill your child. How does that affect your plans? And I think we have to come back again and again to the fact that God's plan is best. Why, why is God's plan best? Well, for one thing, our plan is usually very short view, very short term. God's plans are eternal. The other thing is our plans are mostly selfish. Have you noticed that? My plan is I want to be happy, and I wish the rest of you would cooperate to make that happen. <laughs> that you would do what I want, that you would fulfill my expectations. I, I want you to make my plan work. And the other thing, of course, is that all of us are caught in sin, and which means that our plans tend to be not only selfish, but tinged with sinful. We tend to make ourselves the center of the universe, and God's plan are always God-centered. He has a huge plan, a big plan that is to save people from their sin, to give them life, and it's not our plan. There was a mom who was disturbed about the fact that her kids were so focused on Christmas presents. And so she was talking to them about Christmas, trying to talk about the meaning and the importance of things. And 
it kept coming back to, when do we get to open our presents? It's like the most asked class or question in every class is, will this be on the test? You know, it just warms a teacher's heart to let them know that they're really interested in learning. And so she was trying to get her kids off this focus on presents. And so she had a brilliant moment, and she asked them a question. She said, what did you get for Christmas last year? And most of you can't remember. Certainly not what you got for Christmas two years ago. So she said, what were your favorite memories from Christmas last year? And they started talking about making cookies with grandma and having friends over and being able to spend time as a family. In other words, in hindsight, we often can see things that are really valuable. In foresight, we have a tendency to be very short-term, very selfish. So what is God's perspective? It's the eternal one. And then Gabriel goes on and he says a very important word. He says, Mary, these things are going to happen and I'll give you proof. You're your aunt is pregnant also, and she who was impossible to have a baby is also having a baby. And then he said, for no word of God can ever fail. We believe that God's plan is best because we believe that God knows what he's doing and he's a good God and that he's choosing not what simply makes me happy, but what is best, best. And so Mary said, I am the Lord's servant. May your word to me be fulfilled. That's called surrender. That's called, I understand that God's plan is going to completely derail my plan. And I understand that it's not going to be easy. But I choose to say, okay, God, here I am. I believe your plan is most important. I surrender and I give myself to your plan. And we can go on through the, the Christmas scene and the Christmas story. And you look at Joseph, who also had dreams for his life. If you have your coloring outline, you can color in Joseph right now. And you think about what his story was. Joseph, we often call him a carpenter. Actually, the Hebrew word can mean builder. It can mean stonemason. It can mean carpenter. And as we travel in Israel, we find out that at the time when Jesus was born... There was a nearby city being built, and probably Joseph walked a mile or a mile and a half over there, worked all day, he had a secure job, he had a beautiful wife he was ready to marry, he had a plan for his life, and God interrupted that. And the same thing is true, is God had a plan for Joseph, but it was not Joseph's plan, and it was not going to be easy, but it was going to be the best. What was God's plan for Joseph? He says, this is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit, because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law, yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace. He had in mind to divorce her quietly. You see, Joseph's dream had been trashed. And not only was there the obvious, if you think about the timeline, when Mary got the announcement that she was going to have a child, if you read carefully in the text, she ran off to visit her cousin Elizabeth or her aunt Elizabeth who lived in the hill country and she comes back six months later, six months pregnant. And she says to Joseph, no really, <laughs> this has got to be the hardest story ever to sell. I mean, if you think that sometimes we have troubles Believing in the virgin birth, can you imagine what Joseph's problem was? And so his dream was trashed. I heard a, a painful story from a, somebody who goes to our church this week, and she said, you know, when I was a little girl, my dad was in the Air Force, and so I got to be around fighter planes and pilots, and she said, my dream was to become a fighter pilot. And so she made little models of planes and hung them to the ceiling of her bedroom and she put up posters and her whole orientation towards schoolwork was to get good grades so you could get to the Air Force Academy and she had her life planned out. And her father sat down when she was 10 and he said, Honey, I hate to tell you this, but you need a new dream. He said, I'm in the military and I don't think they're going to let women into the Air Force in your lifetime and I'm sure they're not going to let them be fighter pilots. And she was devastated. 
She went and ripped all the airplane models down and threw them in the trash. She trashed this whole thing, and she began a series of years of rebellion and acting out and anger, and she didn't care about grades, she didn't care about school, she didn't care about anything. And the saddest point is she dropped out of high school, and the year that she would have graduated, the Air Force allowed women to come into the Air Force. We all have dreams, and I find people get devastated by two things. Sometimes people have their heart set on a dream like that, and their dream gets destroyed, and they live the rest of their life in the shambles of their dream. And Joseph could have done that, but God had a better dream for him. And the other thing I find devastates people is they set their heart on a dream, and they spend their whole life working toward it, and they finally achieve their dream, and it's not what they thought it was. They thought it was going to make them happy. They thought it was going to be the center of their life, and it turns out their dream was a small and shallow one. And so what happened to Joseph is God interrupted his life and said, Joseph, your life is going to be different than you thought. And his heart and response was to put her away quietly. He could have mocked her publicly. Can you imagine living in a small Jewish town and all of a sudden everybody knows you're pledged wife comes back pregnant from the hill country, what does that make you look like? And so he's going to not give her like a public censure, he's going to quietly divorce her. And the next piece of it says, after he considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son and prepare to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. You see, he introduces a new piece to this incredible plan. He says the problem with the world is not violence. The problem with the world is not the Romans. The problem with the world is not that the Jewish nation is not in control of their own country and their own destiny. The problem is much deeper than that, that all of us are infected with this disease called sin. And they had no idea, but God was sending Jesus to this earth so that He could become one of us, so that He could give His life and die on the cross, so that He could pay the penalty for sin, so He could be raised to new life, so that you and I could have life eternal. Amen. That that's the message of Christmas. And Joseph was introduced to this idea that Jesus, whose name means salvation of God, that he was coming, not in the way that they'd hoped that he would save them from the Romans, but in a much, much bigger plan that he would save the world from the penalty and the process of sin. And so what did Joseph say? He said, when Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him, and he took Mary home as his wife. But he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name Jesus. Think about Joseph's story. He has to live with the, the shame and the expectations and the gossip, as, as Mary does as well. But he has to go down to Bethlehem, and they set up housekeeping there for a while. He's lost his job. He's lost the way that he's been able to make a living and protect his family. And then they end up going to Egypt to hide out from Herod. His life was not easy. But he had the privilege, as did Mary, of giving a home and giving shelter and giving protection to Jesus. You think about that moment where he said, okay, God, we'll play this your way. You see, if we really believe that God's plan is best, then surrender makes sense. If underneath we really believe our plan is best, then surrender is a battle. And it comes to not just a choice, it comes to how you see the story. And you think of this beautiful, simple story of Mary and Joseph and the child that was given to them, and Jesus is God. And so it was His plan, but it was not easy. And if you can imagine the sacrifice of giving up, filling the universe to being confined to a human body and to living on our torn up planet so that He could give His life for you and me. How does that story relate to you? What does the Christmas worship mean for you and I right now? Let, let me lay it out very simply. 
I can say that God has a beautiful, wonderful plan for you. That God is inviting you to be part of His kingdom, His, His eternal purposes, to be part of this process of His love saving people from their sins. And I can equally assure you, it is not your plan. It will not happen when you want it to. It will not happen in your, in your timeline or in your comfort zone. In fact, God's plan always interrupts our plans. And people, people say, well, this was a terrible time for that to happen. And I always think, so when would you schedule it? <laughs> you see, our plan is all about making us safe and comfortable and happy. And God's plan is for saving the world. It will not always be easy. I think we should not sugarcoat what it means to make Jesus the Lord of your life and to say, I'm going to follow Him. It does not protect you from all the difficult things that come in life. God's promise is not, I will make your life easy. God's promise is, I will never leave you. And I will be with you even if it's the valley of the shadow of death. And then the last point that I hope you have come to believe that God's plan is always best. And the beautiful part of it is God's plan is not just best for you, it's best for everybody around you. That God wants you to adopt and to surrender to His plan so that He can not only transform your life, but so that He can use you to be a light to the world. That God has called us not to live for our own shallow plans, but He invites us into His incredible, eternal plan to save the world. That true peace, true joy, true love come from God. And when you begin to see God as the source of everything we most deeply need, your attitude changes. And surrender becomes logical instead of a battle. I don't, I don't know where you are, but... If you have your colored outline, you, your coloring outline, you can write on the bottom, God's plan is best. And if you believe that, then surrender is easy. So I want to mention two challenges to us. One, if you're here and you've never said, I want to surrender my life to God's plan, it's why we as a church tend to not use the word Christian. We ask people if they're followers of Jesus. Because a follower of Jesus is a present active thing as opposed to, I got baptized when I was a kid. I'm hoping that'll hold. And if you believe God's plan is best, if you are ready to surrender, for some of you, that's not been a part of your life. And maybe your life has been a wreck because you've been running your plan and you're not very good at planning. Or maybe you've fulfilled your dream and you find that it didn't give you the satisfaction you wanted. Either way, what an awesome time at Christmas to come and to say, God, here's my life, and please forgive my sins, and I, I will run it your way instead of mine. And I guarantee you, his plan will be better than yours. And then the second challenge I would give you is if you say, Paul, I am a follower of Jesus, but my life is full of pain right now. There's a lot going on. And I don't know if it's just me or it just seems like this has been a hard year. There's been a lot of people with losses, a lot of things going on. And I've heard more than usual people saying, man, I am not looking forward to this Christmas season. And what I encourage you to do is reach out with faith and say, okay, maybe this season is tough and maybe this moment is tough, but God can still work His plan if I surrender to Him today. And so in the middle of the mess is when we need to say, okay, God, I'm going to trust you. That peace is not when my life is without difficulty. Peace is when I'm saying, okay, God, let's play it your way. That God's love then fulfills us. God gives us the worth that we need. And I want us to just spend a moment in prayer. And I want you to examine your own heart and say, what does Christmas mean to me this year? What, what would God be saying to me if he's speaking personally to my heart about his plan for me? And that the worship team will come, and I'd like to just lead us in prayer. Father, thank you for the celebration in our culture and the lights that come out in the darkness and the children that come and enjoy the presence and families that get together and lots of food. And all of those are wonderful parts of the celebration. But Father, thank you more than that, that you have given us life, that you have entered our world so that 
sins could be paid for, so that we could have life eternal, so that you could direct and control our lives. You could be the Lord of our lives. And if there's anybody here today, God, that does not yet surrender to you, I pray at this quiet moment that they might just say, yeah, God, my life has been a mess. I want to give you my life. I want to turn my heart over to you. I want to trust you, not only to forgive my sins, but to walk with me every day. And Father, if there are people here who are just struggling because it's been a tough year and it's a tough Christmas, that you would give them the same hope that even in the middle of all of the mess, that God, you are still able to work your plan and that they would reach out in faith and trust you and receive your peace. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to have a final song, and I invite you just to sit and listen for the first while. You may not know this song, but it's called Noel. And I find that everybody knows that word, but not everybody knows what it means. And Noel is a word that actually came out of the Latin. It's from Natal, which is simply birth. And that's where the root word of nativity comes from. And then it went into the French language and it became Noel, which means the birth. But it has come to mean the birth. And so Noel really means Jesus is born. And it only refers to one birth. And so when we celebrate Noel, we are celebrating that moment when light came into darkness and that we were given eternal life as a possibility. So I want you just to listen to the first part of it. And then as you perhaps become familiar with it, that you begin to sing a surrender song. God, I'm giving you my life again.
you stand with us? everything. He entered the world, and it is not a story, it is the story. And it's not a simple story, and it is not an easy story. But it's God's story. And when we give our lives to Him and surrender, the Bible says we're born again. And the birth of Christ gives the possibility that you and I can be born again. And eternal life doesn't start with you die, it starts the moment you trust your life to Christ. You say, I give him my life. So let's sing that chorus just once more. Noel, Noel, is a statement of love to Christ. holidays are busy and we're grateful that you came and decided to spend a part of that with us. Would you take those cards that you filled out earlier and just hand them to the aisle and the greeters or others will pick them up quickly. And I want to just invite you to come back if it fits in your family schedule. At six o'clock tonight we are going to have some refreshments, we're going to have the kids choir, we're going to have a photo booth where you can actually have your, your Christmas picture taken as a family and uh, we'll give you access to those. So anyway, it's special. I know your schedule is all over the map. I call this the holiday lottery. Some people's family comes here and we get to see them, people we haven't seen for a long time, and some of our people are gone far away, and we understand that's how it works. But if you're around and you can make that happen, we invite that to be part of your Christmas worship in the midst of all the rest of your celebration. Thanks for coming. God bless you, and Merry Christmas. We're so glad that you're joining us by video. And uh, I know that some of you are just from our church family here, and you're uh, just watching because you can't make it this weekend in person. And I know some of you are watching from around uh, the world, really. And so we just want to say we hope that God blesses you through this. If you have questions, feel free to email me, or if you'd like to let us know um, that God is using this in your life, that's always encouraging. And we have several of you that, that email occasionally. So if you have questions, if you have comments, anything you can... Uh, Give us some feedback. We'd love that. And we trust that God will use this to really enhance your spiritual journey. Thanks.